hope I'm in. Good, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, just just when we thought we were on the clear for technical glitches, I couldn't get in. So uh, welcome, everybody. And I'm, I apologize for keeping you waiting. I had to get a new link sent in. So uh, those of you that are just joining us, welcome to Saskatchewan Health Research Showcase. My name is Elan Pollock. I'm Director of Research for the Saskatchewan Health Authority. And the Saskatchewan Health Authority, along with the Saskatchewan Centre for Patient-Oriented Research, are very uh, proud and pleased to be able to present this uh, virtual learning experience uh, over the course of the next uh, three days. So this afternoon, we're going to be looking at uh, community and clinical, uh, clinical research and, and, and health services research. I'm going to quickly share my screen here. Uh, it's coming, hopefully. Um, I'm hoping you can see my screen at this point. Yeah, you're good. Thumbs up. All right. Thank you. All right. So uh, this afternoon uh, from 2 till 3.30, we will be looking at quick snapshots of uh, six projects that are ongoing in Saskatchewan. So just in case you're wondering, how do we select uh, who is doing an oral presentation and who's doing a poster. We had a, uh, uh, an expert peer review panel that reviewed all of the submissions. We had uh, almost 80 submissions for clinical and health services research, which is absolutely wonderful. So it was extremely difficult to be able to select who would do an oral presentation. I highly urge you to, uh, when you have some time, maybe tonight or on your lunch break, to please go to our website. There are literally 70, 80 other posters that are extremely interesting and extremely well done. We have limited time here. And if I had my way, I could just uh, spend days having these uh, mini snapshots and, and, and sharing that. So uh, please do, because again, now that we're virtual, we are going to miss uh, the, the, the theme of the concert, uh, the, the, the event is always inspire, connect and celebrate. And so being virtual presents its own set of challenges. So there is a chat um, and, and you can leave comments on our online poster session. So I encourage you to go there when you have time, it'll be open till the end of the month, leave a comment, leave a question for the researcher and we're gonna really try to encourage to make some connections, uh, some interaction there. Even if it's a simple thumbs up, I enjoyed this. I think it's meaningful for the researchers that went to the effort to prepare a poster, but not have that opportunity in our, in our typical networking session. So I'm already late, so I'm, I'm gonna try to move this along. Just a few very gentle reminders. Everybody has been muted. You can leave your camera on or off, whatever you please. Um, we will be, if you're having any connections, use the chat function or just jot down this telephone number, uh, 766-5140. That's our, our tech support. So thank you, Jeff, for looking after us so well. Um, and then we will try to save questions to the end. I don't, when I say to the end, you don't have to wait to the literal last, last bit of it, type it in, but we just are not going to interrupt the presenter uh, in the middle of his or her research. So. When you, uh, if we can unmute you and invite you to ask your question in person, I ask that you introduce yourself uh, by name, where you're from, and try to limit yourself to one question. We do have some online um, chat monitors that are gonna be looking. So if there's clusters of questions that appear to be fairly similar, then we will call upon, if, we, if there's time, one person. Each presenter has 10 minutes and that includes questions. So we're certainly hoping uh, that we can answer as many questions as possible. Each presenter will be approximately seven minutes uh, with only three minutes. If you don't get your question answered, please, um, the posters will be there. Reach out to them. I know every researcher, that is probably one of the biggest uh, rewards is having somebody connect and say, that was really interesting. Or, you know, I, I have this question. So uh, please don't hesitate to do that. 
Um, our first presenter on that note here is uh, Dr. Kara Fletcher, and she's going to be discussing mental health and substance abuse treatment, what's working and what can be improved. So I think a timely question. Um, it's always been timely, but it's, I think, been highlighted even more uh, during the pandemic. So I'm going to uh, allow Kara to share her screen and uh, look forward to her, her presentation. All right, hello everybody. Actually, I'm presenting today with uh, Stacy McHenry. So Stacy's gonna pull up the uh, presentation. And so I'm with the uh, Faculty of Social Work at the University of Regina here in Saskatoon. And I have been doing this project with Stacy, um, who is a PhD, PhD candidate at the University of Saskatchewan. All right. Perfect. Thanks, Stacy. We can go to the next slide. So really, this question came out of uh, a SHRF establishment uh, grant where we decided to uh, look at existing treatment outcome data in the mental health and addiction services unit through the Saskatchewan Health Authority. And the data that we're looking at for this study actually comes from uh, the former uh, boundaries of the Saskatoon Health Authority. So that's the or health region, I, I said it was called. So that's what we're actually looking at. So what we're doing is we are reviewing, this is kind of hot off the presses, uh, first stage uh, data that we're, we're presenting to you today. So what we did was we looked at better outcomes now data. And so you may have heard of this, but it is a uh, clinical tool that is used throughout the health authority. And it is to look at client self-report on outcomes. So there's two different questionnaires that clients fill out each time they attend a session. They fill out an outcome rating scale, which is how a client or service user feels at the beginning of the session. So it asks questions about personal well-being, looking at interpersonal, social, and overall functioning. And at the end of the session, they're asked to complete a session rating scale. And this is how the client or service user feels the session went at the end of the appointment. So this considers the therapeutic relationship, meeting goals, approach, method, et cetera. So what we wanted to do was take a look at all of this information and get a better understanding of what's working well for the uh, folks who are attending mental health and addiction services and what, who is leaving, at what point are they leaving, and how are they rating their general overall treatment outcomes. We can go to the next slide. So there is a massive amount of self-report data that we uh, looked at, and Stacy will break that down for you. But essentially, we want to know who is staying in treatment, who is leaving, factors that impact, impact client retention, uh, what is going well, and identifying client characteristics. So the goal here for us in terms of what we're hoping to get out of the study at the end is to improve treatment retention, improve client satisfaction, and have a better understanding of what are the various uh, pr program outcomes under the umbrella of mental health and substance uh, use in the health authority. Stacy. Stacy, we can't hear you. You're on mute button. Not anymore. There you go. There I'm you go. Sorry. I'll make it. <laughs> We back? You're back. All right. Bonus. All right. Sorry about that. Um, yeah. So carrying on with what uh, Kara was saying, we collected data from two clinical programs. So um, clients from people working within the adult community, mental health team and community addictions team. Uh, Kara also said that we had a massive amount of data and we do. Um, we have data from about 3,600 clients and from about uh, 40,000 individual sessions. So we were collecting uh, demographic data, so age and gender, um, the scores on the two self-report tools, uh, different program and service enrollment, um, how long uh, clients were involved and why they terminated uh, their involvement. So that's what I'll get into in our results section. 
and that we analyze quantitatively as using SPSS. All right, so just as a basic overview, and I'll go through this fairly quickly because not a lot of time. Um, so there's eight different mental health or substance use programs that are available through SHA um, and multiple services that then fall beneath that, uh, those sort of umbrellas. Uh, the high enrollment is individual counseling and the adult family, the adult family program and the lower are in uh, the addictions corrections initiative, which is um, mandated through or participation is mandated through the court system and then also adult chemical dependency program. Generally speaking, uh, treatment is fairly short term. Uh, the average is about five months, but there's a lot of variability in that. I think it went up to about a year. Uh, the mean age is actually fairly high and I'll come back uh, to that in really shortly. Uh, but the mean age of uh, clients that were included in this particular data set was 38. Um, in terms of gender distribution, percentage was female followed by male. Uh, there, there is a very, uh, small, I guess, proportion that was transgender. Uh, looking at those average scale scores, um, there's a difference between the ORS score, so that outcome measure, and the SRS score, so the session scales, uh, whereas the SRS scores were higher, which is very much typical um, using these tools. So focusing really specifically on age here, um, the when looking at it by age group, the highest enrollment were for people sort of in that mid range, so between 25 and 44. And the lowest enrollment was for the youngest age group that we looked at and the oldest age group that we looked at. Um, and there are very similar percentages for those two groups. Um, looking at age, again, related to those uh, different self-report measures, uh, the S and the SR was a very similar trend where these scores were the lowest uh, for the youngest clients, so between 18 and 24, and then increased um, as age increased, which was a fairly interesting finding, um, we thought. And again, referring back to that young group, because there's obviously something interesting going on here, um, they also spent the shortest amount of time enrolled in a program once they access services. So that youngest age group again. Uh, just some implications or some things to think about. Um, it is interesting to think about why these groups aren't as well represented, uh, particularly that youngest age group. Uh, they certainly have a high prevalence of uh, mental health issues and if not, I guess, I guess looking at certain age groups or depending on where you look. And yeah, it looked based on some of what we've seen that there does need to be some further consideration of specific needs or expectations or, you know, what uh, this age group might want to have a better experience and, you know, stay more committed to their programs. For gender, um, the ORS scores, so the outcome ratings, uh, showed that uh, males had the highest uh, consistently, so they had the best sort of perceived health, I guess, going into the session. Um, and the SRS scales, females uh, rated those the highest. So um, one thing to look at here is that um, what the ORS represents. So it's representing the kind of, like I said, the status going into um, a, a session. So these are for transgender and female clients. Um, and so it may be that some tailoring here is involved to address specific needs. I believe there's only one gender specific program um, through the SHA right now, and it has very low enrollment. For the SRS scores, it may be that um, males are perceiving less of a fit between what they would like to achieve in a session and what's actually being achieved. So that in and of itself leaves a little room for um, tailoring as well. Uh, for programs, uh, the highest score or sorry, lowest scores for um, the ORS were individual counseling and adult mental health programs. Um, so this is suggesting that um, the clients in these programs may be you know, having this perceived well-being. Um, so something to consider there. Uh, but for alternatives to violence, the Addictions Corrections Initiative and the Adult Chemical Dependency Program this were actually significantly higher uh, compared to the others. 
And there's a lot of possible reasons for this. Um, it could be some sort of bias because some of these programs are mandated. So, you know, to report that they're feeling better than they are perhaps. And for the SRS, so looking at the session scores, uh, the adult family and alternatives to violence programs were significantly higher. So, um, you know, those two programs may be a good place to start if looking for um, ways to improve some of the existing programs. In terms of completing programs, um, they were most frequently completed or most frequently terminated. Uh, because the full program had been completed, which is what I would imagine you're looking for. Uh, for the ORS scores, there were lower scores between um, the scores and client withdrawal as a reason for closing or client no-show. Um, so it's just showing that in order to keep clients involved, um, you know, we've really got to focus on those core issues and actually leading to meaningful, meaningful improvement for the client. Uh, for the SRS scores, uh, there's lower scores between our lower scores that are related to client no-show um, and also a relationship between higher scores and program completion. So, uh, you know, people are showing up when they are perceiving these sessions to be effective is basically kind of the gist of that. Uh, so overall, this is just really highlighting how much um, that perception of well-being and outcomes um, and the quality of the therapeutic relationship really matter. So just a couple of conclusions and implications. Uh, using this data from the uh, bone system provides a lot of insight and a lot of information. Um, and I think, yeah, there's a lot of value in using that to improve treatment. Um, looking at some of the general implications based on what we have so far, um, there does tend to be a general level of satisfaction with the structure of sessions and the approaches that are we using um, and you know, relationships with uh, healthcare professionals. So that's great. Uh, as I mentioned, you know, some of the uh, sessions that look a little bit better could be, um, or say the adult family program could be used to guide other programs. Um, again, tailoring is likely going to have a positive impact in some ways. Um, that age uh, variable, like I said, is pretty interesting. I think that um, it would be important to try to increase scores for both or for that age group, uh, the same with gender. And yeah, next we are going to try to figure out kind of the why of some of these findings. So use qualitative to talk to clients and find out what their experiences are in their own work kind of fill in some of the blanks. Great. Well, thank you very much. Um, I will open it up quickly if there's any comments or questions uh, from our viewers. And, you know, I think this, this project really exemplifies how important it is to embed the research into the care delivery model. And in doing so can really help us make some um, important changes. Uh, I am going to just, I think we have time for just one. We're, we are a little bit over here, but I'm going to open up the, the, the room to Sandy, uh, and she has a question here. Hello. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you so much for sharing your presentation. It's very timely at this. Uh, I know during the pandemic we got distracted, but I think it's very important to address that right now. I just was had a question about how you define your clients who are in recovery versus those in relapse. And I was wondering whether you had any metrics to measure uh, client recovery and wellness for those who were already participating in existing uh, promotion programs or harm reduction programs. Thank you. Um, so recovery and relapse measures, I'm not, are you referring to the S and the S? Uh, yes, I was just wondering if you, if you ever, if you had that uh, included in your analysis or if that was something you're collecting. Hi, Sandy. No. I, yeah, no. <laughs> no. You well, thank you. Care. Yeah, no, we, we didn't. Unfortunately, we don't have that kind of detail. We just have these two scales, which are looking at self-report of outcomes. So we don't really actually know in terms of where uh, each individual client was in terms of their treatment or how they were defining that. That's what we're hoping with uh, phase two is to do some qualitative interviews and get a better sense of um, what these results mean uh, for, for each client. Thank you.
And again, uh, if, if you have any further questions or comments, please leave them in the chat room. And this session is being recorded and we'll be certain to uh, share it with uh, uh, Kara and Stacy. So again, on behalf of Saskatchewan Health Research Showcase, thank you very much for sharing uh, your, your research with us. Uh, at this point, we are going to move on to our next presentation by Dr. Sarah Donkers, who will be speaking to us about the individualized physiotherapy and activity coaching in multiple sclerosis. Welcome, uh, Dr. Donkers. Thanks, Lan. Thanks, everyone, for being here. I'm so glad that the uh, conference uh, is going, even if virtual. It's uh, important now ever, more than ever to connect, and it's always fun uh, to celebrate. Um, Yes. So I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, our project. Uh, this was, uh, thank you to uh, Skipper and Scherf both. This was a Sprout grant. So it was jointly funded by our Saskatchewan Centre for Patient-Oriented Research and our Health Research Foundation. Uh, I am presenting on behalf of our team. We have a lovely representation um, from a number of different stakeholders on our team. So uh, my co-PI, Catherine Knox, was the former director of the uh, Saskatchewan MS Clinic. We have patient and family advisors. Uh, we have representatives from the MS Society, as well as the Health Authority, um, and then researchers and uh, neurologists. So a really fun team to work with. We are uh, not done data collection yet, so I'll put that disclaimer up front. Um, but I'm, I'm very happy to still be able to talk about the program. So uh, the key thing that got us here is fortunately the landscape of multiple sclerosis is changing. So um, even though we don't have a cure yet, people with MS are living longer. Um, the disease modifying drugs that are coming out um, are, are becoming more effective uh, at decreasing the, the rate of uh, progression. Um, but we also are getting more information on the benefits of uh, non-pharmaceutical approaches. And physical activity is actually proposed to be the most important non-pharmaceutical intervention for people living with multiple sclerosis. Um, to better dive into how um, and who should be doing what and when uh, with regards to exercise and disease modification in MS, we really need more people to be active for longer. So we decided to target people early on in um, uh, their MS diagnosis. So uh, they had to be sedentary, but uh, still ambulatory. Uh, and we did a targeted enrollment uh, through a mail out uh, through the MS, Saskatchewan MS drugs database. So we had um, a number of um, surveys pre-collected on individuals that reported their physical activity level. And then we randomized uh, those individuals who were uh, sedentary and um, we mailed out. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about that in a second. Um, but how we got to our intervention was uh, to date, like when we put this program together, no one looked at um, targeting multiple factors together. So there's lots of research about uh, barriers and facilitators to being active, some research, research about the mechanisms um, and methods of being active, and then some uh, research looking into ways to interact with these barriers. Um, so we decided, we did a lit review looking at all of the influencers and decided to pull together um, a unique individualized approach. So um, we wanted to provide access to expert, um, but individualized access to uh, a level of expertise. So someone um, who not only knows about exercise, but about multiple sclerosis, combining that with uh, behavior change strategies, as well as individualized methods of being active. Um, and really what we learned that combining those together and trying to deliver it to the people living all across Saskatchewan uh, is that we began exploring really unique models of care delivery um, to this, this support. Um, so the consistent features, imagine tying this together to write a grant. <laughs> Everyone's gonna get an intervention, <laughs> but it's gonna be individualized. Um, we did have very consistent features to the intervention. So each individual uh, participant, we had 120 participants enrolled across the province living with MS. Um, they were getting an intervention from a, a physiotherapist. So they had, uh, unique individualized access to a physiotherapist whose goal was to um, uh, 
uh, increase this person's physical activity levels, but we didn't care how they were being active. We just wanted to start where they were and um, work on individualized ways to increase it. Uh, and then we were combining that with behavior change strategies. So um, Saskatchewan does have the highest rate of MS in the world uh, and very timely. We also have um, a lower population density. So it was really interesting um, trying to recruit from across the province, but also trying to be representative um, of uh, service delivery. So where people are living and how we can give them um, their services. So this is rep this image is representing um, not only where we mailed our surveys out to. So remember we had this database of about 800 people. We randomized it. We purposely set um, 200 aside. And then we, we randomized the groups into um, three mail outs. And then we just uh, capped our enrollment once we had our 120 people. So this shows not only where we uh, mailed out to, but then the white dots are showing um, who responded. And I have to say, we had a really, really high response rate. So we were able to enroll 120 people in a two and a half month period over uh, last summer. So between um, July and uh, September uh, 2019. And the other thing I wanna say about this is um, even though Saskatchewan has the highest rate of MS, there, there are no hot spots. So as you see increased uh, population, you're gonna see more people living with, with MS. Um, so yeah, we had a nice representation of uh, the Southwest, Southeast, South Central, um, and then Saskatchewan, uh, a little bit less in the North uh, West and Northeast, um, but still about 20 participants from that area. So as I mentioned, our, our data analysis uh, is still ongoing. Our, our data analysis hasn't um, started for our 12 month, our primary outcome measure yet. Um, we have a few more 12 month assessments to do. Um, but prior to delivering our intervention, we were able to train 14 uh, physiotherapists. And these are individuals um, located across the province. So prior to this, um, our, our care or our rehab services were through um, the Sa Saskatoon City Hospital, through the MS Clinic and the Rehab Day Services. Um, and there isn't a natural um, uh, expertise uh, in MS, in rehab spread across the province. So we were able to um, uh, take individuals with expertise in neural rehab and our training updated them on um, the current uh, evidence in, in MS, advances in MS, as well as the intervention design uh, and behavior change. Uh, so through the process of doing this research, um, we were able to um, improve uh, the training level of 14 therapists uh, spread across the province. Um, and these therapists are amazing. The study would not have kept running during a pandemic if it wasn't for how amazing they were. Um, we had to stop in person for about two months, but uh, besides that, uh, we were able to keep the study running because we had naturally built in alternative methods of accessing uh, their care. So we had um, virtual telehealth, uh, telephone, all of those uh, messages going on before the pandemic. So our primary outcome is from baseline to 12 months, looking at their change in physical activity. Uh, the study is running over an 18 month period though. And we're also looking at um, the interventions impact on their confidence for self-management, uh, confidence for managing uh, their physical activity level as well as their MS. And if there was any um, impact on symptoms. Uh, I mentioned already, we are uh, done the intervention. We have a few more 12 month uh, assessments to do. And then um, we're following them for six months after that. And anyone who was originally, the 60 individuals originally randomized to the control group, they are being offered um, a six month version of the intervention. And yeah, so we really learned that although people with MS have ongoing access um, to an MS nurse through the MS clinic and the MS drugs program, uh, they really have minimal access to uh, professional support that's uh, important in um, really helping them uh, stay functional uh, and address other areas of their life. So um, I just wanted to share, uh, we were really excited about this grant. It's one of the largest um, rehab grants in MS um, in the province. We're able to provide services to 120 people. And it's an amazing team that has 
led to a number of other projects. So um, uh, NeuroSask, uh, anyone living with a chronic disease can, can join. It's a free virtual program run every Tuesday and Thursday. Um, it's a 30 minute seated movement class followed by a 30 minute connect session. Uh, and then we have our patient pages up for our MS care pathway, uh, but not the provider pages yet uh, because of COVID. So yeah, uh, just some resources. Again, uh, they're not just for MS, anyone living with a chronic disease uh, or who might benefit from a virtual program during the pandemic is welcome to join NeuroSask. And thank you to everyone uh, for listening and for those involved in the project. Great. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Donkers. We've got lots of uh, really positive, uh, affirming comments in the chat room about the importance and nice to see somebody's researching this. I'm gonna squeeze in uh, two quick questions here. The first is from Chris and it's a methods question. I'm being a little bit selfish because I was wondering as we move to a provincial model and trying to increase our numbers for studies, uh, your enrollment was good, but Chris has a, has a specific methods question and then I'm going to convert over to or, or invite uh, uh, Dale to join the group. So we'll, we'll go first to Chris to ask his question of you. Hey, sir. probably kind of selfish that it's me calling in because I know I bug you with questions all the time. Um, but just wondering on your thoughts on how you could have increased enrollment in Northern communities or knowing you and your team have already put thought into that and that's already planned for a future study. Um, but really how to encourage individuals from Northern communities to join or make sure you're reaching them. Yeah, great question. So um, kind of a, a double edged answer here. Um, so first of all, we uh, went with, with a pre-existing database. We didn't advertise the study and invite people to enroll. So we were, were limited by that, right? Um, and then the second thing is there, there's that relationship as our, um, our more Northern communities um, having a much more um, Indigenous population and uh, MS is, is quite rare in Indigenous populations. Um, uh, which is great. Uh, anybody who doesn't have to get MS is, is a great thing. Um, and so we feel like the rural areas uh, around there, we, we did get a, a good representation. Um, it's just not as proportionate as, as some of our other areas. So um, yes, we do have another project that was just funded. It hasn't started yet, but uh, it's called Building Towards a Neural Recovery Model of Care in MS. And we will be talking a lot about how to service the entire province there. So let me know if you have any ideas. Awesome. Thanks, Sarah. And uh, Dale, can, uh, are you able to ask your question here? Can we bring you online? While we're figuring that out, uh, uh, Sarah, I will say that there's quite a few questions in the chat room and uh, again, accolades, but the, asking for the website and so on. So I will get you once we log off, if you wouldn't mind. Oh, Dale, we see you there. If you wouldn't mind going in there and just there's lots of questions that uh, I think we can carry the conversation on. Dale? Um, I really didn't have a question. The questions I actually put up here were for <laughs> for the last people, but... Oh, okay. um, um, <laughs> I'm sorry, uh, I just read that. Yeah, so that's that's what my questions were for. It seems like I think about things and then I get them up there after everybody's gone. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you. And, and again, uh, Sarah, on behalf of everybody uh, for the Showcase Planning Committee that are virtual claps up going, uh, great work. And uh, it's hard to believe one year ago you were hobbling in with a foot cast. <laughs> Uh, at last year's research showcase. And so I am certainly looking forward to a year from now learning about the findings of this uh, very important work. So thank you again. Okay, so I'm going to uh, doo -doo -doo, go back to share screen, moving on to our next presentation. Uh, very timely, two very important things. Uh, uh, Canada, where cannabis use is now legal, and certainly the growing, um, increasing emphasis and acknowledgement of PTSD. So today's presentation uh, will be from th uh, this team here, being led by Mary Ellen Gibson, and she will be presenting today about the insight on to social influences. Speaking too fast. 
insight into social influence on veterans' use of medical cannabis to manage their PTSD sy symptoms. So I'll turn it over to Mary Ellen and um, welcome on behalf of Research Showcase. Perfect. Thanks so much for having us. I'm just going to share my screen quickly here so we're ready to go. So uh, I also have two other co-presenters co with me today. Um, so I'm hoping that you can make it so that uh, both uh, Chad and Gerald can also speak at some point here. Uh, that should be possible. Yep, there we go. Okay. It happening. Perfect. Um, and hopefully you can see my screen well here, but thanks so much for having us. Uh, I'm Mary Ellen Gibson. I'm a project manager in the One Health and Wellness Office of the Department of Sociology at the University of Saskatchewan on Treaty 6 territory in the homeland of the Métis. Um, thank you so much for that introduction. That's, that's perfect for this project. Just to give you a little bit of background, um, we're seeing more and more that PTSD is a serious health concern in our military, especially among veterans who have left the force. And we're seeing that medical cannabis is being prescribed for combating those PTSD symptoms, as well as physical uh, conditions that veterans may be coming home with. And we really wanted to look at some of the social influences that are impacting veterans' use of medical cannabis. Most uh, studies tend to look at medical implications and effects of cannabis um, on, on the general well being of veterans. Um, and just so that everyone knows, the results that we're sharing today are um, an extraction of medical cannabis related data from a much larger project that looked at the impact of psychiatric service dogs on the health and well being of veterans. So, this is just a really small part of a much bigger project, but one that we thought was really interesting. So our larger project was patient-oriented, community-based, longitudinal with a time series design when we interviewed veterans, uh, five different veterans in semi-structured interviews over a one-year period with six data collection points. So then from there, we were overlooking the interview data and we had two of our research assistants use the Bronze and Clark a guide for thematic analysis to pull out cannabis related themes um, and kind of organize them in a certain way. So uh, I wanted to invite two of our patient advisors who are veterans to come and talk a little bit about the results. So the first result, and I'm hoping Chad can talk a little bit about his experience, but the first result that we saw was that the military had a very significant impact on veterans perceptions of cannabis. Chad, do you want to tell us a bit about your experience? Hi, everyone. Um, yeah, so the day you join the military, marijuana is unacceptable. Uh, I don't know what, to, what it's like now. I'm retired. But uh, to start using marijuana, it took me off the 17 pills a day to just use the marijuana. So the effects of uh, not taking narcotics nonstop, sleep, anxiety, and everything else to use in a natural substance was amazing. But uh, it was a very, very hard to cross over to actually uh, use it because your whole career, you're taught that everything you do, you cannot use marijuana. Uh, if you got caught with it, using it, your career, I don't know if it would have ended, but it would have definitely slowed down. Uh, so to come over, to take that leap across that line, to actually use it for medication was very, very hard to do. Very hard just to tie it into your brain after uh, you're programmed in the army and you're programmed that it's a negative thing. You're programmed to go out and have a few drinks, take everything that the doctors give you. But when it comes time to uh, smoke a little bit of weed or take it in an edible or a, a capsule, it's 100%. It's, it's very, very hard to do because of the stigma of if you're using pot, you just can't be in the military, you can't perform. Thanks so much, Chad. And the other piece that really came out was this idea that the veterans drew a line. And it was kind of different for each veteran, but they drew a line for themselves in what was considered proper use of cannabis and what was inappropriate. Uh, is this the case for you, Chad? Oh, I think you're muted real quick here. Hey, there we go. A hundred percent. When I first started using it, and even to this day, it's medicine. Uh, I know I got a lot of buddies now. It's legal to go out, the uh, smoke a little bit of pot, have a few beers, have a great time for themselves. 
I'll go out and I will have a couple beers with them. But when it comes to using the cannabis, I only use it as medicine. Um, to me, going out and smoking a joint on a Friday night with a few beers is no different than taking Oxycontin with a few beers. It's a, it's 100% used for medical purposes and not for uh, self-pleasure or entertainment. Thanks so much, Chad. And that's something that we really did see with all the veterans that we talked to. Um, now I'm going to ask... Gerald to step in here too. Um, we really saw that veterans were really interested in using medical cannabis or, or try it as a prescription for some of their ailments. And for Gerald, would you mind telling us a little bit about the timelines for your use of medical cannabis? Okay. Uh, yeah. So let's let's go back 20 years here and and day one in the forces. Uh, I decided that my my retirement plan was the the day I retired I was going to get a big bag of weed and go smoke it, but that's where the but then of course twenty years later uh, I I went and uh, I I was hurt and uh, had PTSD and and ended up with medical marijuana and and a whole different idea on on how to use it, uh, so. Now I, I do only use uh, marijuana for medical purposes, obviously, uh, but it's it's actually helped me get off of uh, all of the the narcotics that I was on. I, I was taking uh, high dose uh, opiates every day. Uh, the amount of pills that I was taking uh, would not actually fit in one hand. Uh, I had to. It it was almost a meal. Uh, the amount of pills that I was taking and, and it would fill me up. Um, but marijuana has actually helped me get off of each and every one of those. Uh, it's, it's weird. Um, you hear about marijuana being that, that gateway drug to harder, harder substances, but my experience was a hundred percent opposite of that. I used it to get off of, off of the opioids, off of the benzos, and off of the sleeping drugs, which uh, that was the hardest one for me to get off of. I was reliant on on uh, Ambien to get to sleep every night for the last five years, and using cannabis to get a night's sleep is so much better for my body and just just better for for me as a person. The not being reliant on that little pill. Um, uh, and yeah, I, I don't want to ramble too much, but, uh, it, it really has been rather freeing the, the idea that these little plants and, and these flowers can, can help me out that much. Whereas big pharma was just throwing more pills at me. Thanks so much for sharing Gerald and both you, Gerald and Chad, you both touched on and really well explained um, our fourth result, which was the replacement of traditional medications with med medical cannabis. And that was really to reduce the negative side effects associated with what we would consider traditional medication, as well as just like the number of medications being used. Thank you so much, retired Master Corporal Chad Bridger and retired Sergeant Gerald Henwood. I'm not used to using your entire um, title there, but thank you guys so much. Um, and just a quick conclusion here is we really found when talking with the veterans that their use of medical cannabis was really influenced by social factors and especially the military in which they had been part of for so much of their lives. And so we just want to urge researchers in the future and, and medical professionals who are working with veterans to really think about these social impacts and some of that um, cognitive dissonance that some of those veterans may be feeling or experiencing um, after they retire and they start using medical cannabis. Uh, thank you guys so much for having us um, and hopefully we can answer some questions if we have any. Great, thank you very much. That was wonderful. And we do have some questions coming in, so we'll go quickly here. I'd like to invite Maeve uh, to uh, pose her question to your team. Hi everyone, can you hear me okay? Great. Um, so uh, my name is Mae McLean and I'm a research analyst with the SHA Research Department. I do a lot of work in mental health and addictions and I'm just wondering if in the province um, 
there's a there's a financial barrier for veterans accessing marijuana and and marijuana uh, related treatments um, for PTSD and other combat related injuries. So are there financial barriers presently in the province for veterans? Thanks so much for the question, Maeve. Um, great to hear from you. Uh, so the veterans that we talked to were having um, support from Veterans Affairs Canada in getting their prescriptions. So that was part, uh, partially to try and help relieve some of that financial burden. But Veterans Affairs Canada does have a cap on the amount of cannabis that a veteran is um, allowed to be reimbursed for. So that can definitely be a really big part of that financial barrier. Um, when it comes to province to province, some of those barriers can include just access, uh, especially with non-medical legalization and what that access actually looked like um, and the demand that happened. Um, is there anything, Gerald or Chad, that you'd like to add about the financial barriers? Uh, myself personally, I haven't had any uh, for finances. Veterans Affairs, Veterans Affairs pays for it. Uh, regards to getting accessible, I deal with a manufacturer here in Ontario, and are very, very um, medical marijuana veterans oriented. And I have had no problems. I've been using now for a few years. So I've had no problems ever getting product or having to worry about paying for the product. Awesome, Gerald. Uh, my, my experience has been very similar to, to Chad's. Uh, I go through a third party, uh, company here in Winnipeg and they do all of the paperwork and set me up with a doctor and they send all of the paperwork to VAC, uh, VAC then approves and they set me up with, uh, with providers out of Ontario and the, I order the, the product and it gets delivered directly to my house. Zero cost to me. That's great. I'm going to squeeze in if, if you don't mind. I've got one more. Um, well, I've got lots of questions and comments, but I'm going to squeeze in one more because I think this might be a good connection. I'm going to turn it over to Michelle McCarran uh, to pose her question. Hi, thank you for a wonderful presentation, all three of you. Um, I'm Michelle McCarran. I'm a research scientist with the Saskatchewan Health Authority, and I also work part-time with the Canadian Institute of Public Safety Research and Treatment at the U of R, where we do um, mental health research with public safety personnel. Um, so I was really interested in this study, and I was wondering, in your interviews, what PTSD symptoms in particular did you find people were were reporting as being most improved with cannabis versus previous treatments that they've tried? You know what, I think um, instead of having me answer, I'm going to ask Gerald and Chad if they wouldn't mind. Uh, let's start with you, Gerald. Would you mind uh, letting Michelle know uh, what cannabis has helped you with? Yeah, uh, sorry. Uh, it, it, some of these are a little hard to, to put into words sometimes. Uh, so uh, it's... I, I've already uh, spoken to uh, the the lack of, of the ability to to fall asleep and stay asleep, but cannabis has helped with that. Um, what I haven't talked about is the extreme frustration and the ability to, or not ability, but the tendency to uh, to fall into uh, a rage uh, very quickly and. Cannabis does help with that. Uh, the the euphoria and the and just the the general well being feeling that comes from from uh, from cannabis uh, helps with that on on a daily basis. It's it's just easier to live my life with cannabis, uh, and it's easier on everybody else in my life when I'm uh, when I am using cannabis. Thanks so much, Gerald. Chad, do you have anything to add? Uh, yeah, I, I had a serious injury overseas, broke three vertebrae in my lower back, two in my neck. Uh, if it wouldn't be for CBD oil, I don't think I would even still be walking. Uh, the more I walk, the more I work out, the more I exercise, the better the injury is, just because we all know what muscle structure is. Uh, so I went from not being able to walk down the street to getting ready, hopefully, next summer to qualify again for a Boston Marathon. Uh, not only that, sleep. We can't heal our brains. We can't get better without sleep. And I hated taking sleep meds because I took a sleep med at seven o'clock. Then I'm done for the day so that I could fall asleep at 10 o'clock, get a rest of sleep till six o'clock. 
But then I was always groggy when I got up till 10, 11 o'clock. So you're, you're like a zombie. Uh, I take the bare minimum dose of marijuana now an hour, an hour and a half before I go to bed, I fall asleep. If I do go into a nightmare, I can go outside. I can have a couple puffs. I go right back to sleep. I don't care about uh, the nightmare anymore. And when I wake up at 5, 5.30 to go out with my dog, I'm fresh. I, uh, I don't have the side effects of taking the sleep meds. So it, it's, it really is life-changing. I hope that answered your question, Michelle. I knew that the guys could say it even better than I could. It does. And thank you, Gerald and Chad, for being so candid about your personal experiences. You're welcome. Yeah, yeah that was a great presentation. And I'm going to um, invite all three of you to the chat room. Lots of comments, lots of positive feedback there. So I'll let you carry on the discussion and we'll move on. But uh, again, thank you so much for this wonderful presentation today. So uh, moving on to our next presentation, hopefully everybody can see my screen here. Uh, we are looking at an assessment of patient history, a pilot study in Saskatchewan. And uh, I'm not sure, I think we have a, a, a trio of presenters here, uh, but an but a old friend of mine, uh, Jackie Messer-LePage is, is the lead author on this. So I will turn it over, uh, or I'm not sure who's presenting, Rashad? Uh -huh. Hi there. Uh, my name is Rashid and I'm presenting today and Jackie, oh. unfortunately, she's not available today uh, because her father-in-law, uh, he's in hospitals. So that's why I'm taking the, I'm, I'm covering on behalf of Jackie today. Wonderful, wonderful to have you here and we're looking forward to the presentation. Thank you for thank clarifying that. You. Oh, thank you so much. So um, hi everyone, good afternoon and um, thank you for taking the time to join our short overview today of a pilot study that explored paramedic use of patient electronic health data. Can you see my screen? No, we cannot. Oh. So. Mm. How, uh, okay. okay, let me share my screen. So it should either be at the bottom or the top of your screen, share screen there. And I'm not sure, uh, Jeff, if we have a copy, if we can actually pull up that and, and advance the slides or whether we can walk Rashad through sharing it. Oh, yeah. have a oh, oh, I'm so sorry. No worries. Okay, it's working. We're good. It's all good. But, uh, okay, let me open it from here. Okay, there you go. You can see it right now, right? Yes. Okay, thank you. So, um, sorry, sorry for the interruption. Um, before going to the presentation, I just would like to introduce myself. My name is Rashid Al Mamon, and I work for uh, Saskatchewan College of Paramedics as a the policy, uh, senior policy and research analyst. I also work as a part time with the Canadian Organization of Paramedic Regulator. So, uh, the title of our project is uh, Assessment of Access to Patient History, a pilot study in Saskatchewan. So, if we uh, go to our introduction part, you can see that, I mean, like you know that paramedics are often one of the first people on the scene when an emergency arises. So as a regulatory body in this province, we have to ensure that these professionals, I mean, I mean the paramedic professionals are fully competent to provide the necessary care to the patient on the scene. In Saskatchewan and Canada, most paramedics working on ambulance do not have access to the, to the electronic health record. In fact, we are unable to find much data at all in this area, even internationally. For this reason, we decided to run a pilot project to determine if additional patient information would impact clinical diagnosis and treatment to the patient on the scene. So we have conducted, conducted a uh, literature review and we have found that there was a consider, considerable body of 
research relating to other health professionals, including nurses, physicians, and paramedics, sorry, pharmacists. And this research identified a dynamic and supportive relationship between having access to electronic health information and a better patient care experience. On the other hand, there was very little literature or research in the area of paramedic access to the electronic health record. So it became very clear that we needed to add to the body of research in this area by exploring paramedic use of patient information to inform clinical treatment. Therefore, in terms of the objective of our project, we wanted to evaluate paramedic perception regarding the use of patient information to support diagnosis and treatment. Sorry, I'm still. So therefore we asked our participant how they felt about having access to additional patient information in this field. And secondly, we asked, did they think that access to the information was important to evaluate their practice? And this is EHR viewer. And to get the access to EHR viewer, we have to comply with the Saskatchewan Health Information Protection Act, which is called HIPAA. In Saskatchewan, we have a number of data sets that are housed within the eHealth Saskatchewan organization. This data set can be accessed using what is called EHR viewer. On the slide, you can see the types of data that are readily available to use user using the e-viewer. I mean, like if you vote, if you have access to the e-viewer, then you can have uh, ability to look at those information. I mean, Sean, information about the lab, yes? I'm sorry to interrupt you. We're not seeing your slides and it seems to have frozen on the very first one that you've shown. So um, I'm just getting a few messages in that people are not seeing your presentation. So um, would you Before mind to that, share? Do I send it my copy to you? Oh, I don't know. Can you see it right now? Right now, we're only seeing slide one objective of the study. So as you you, you were referring to uh, the types of data. Yes. Uh, do I send it my backup copy to Scopper email address? Uh, do you have any option to share that slide? Uh, you know what, maybe, hang on. Um, yeah, so they're just seeing your email. Maybe what we'll do, um, can anybody, uh, uh, Tammy or anybody there, uh, go into the Google Drive or, or Jeff, can you go in and, and retrieve the PowerPoint presentation and show it from our end? I am trying to find a copy of it. I'm not sure if we actually received it. Sorry. Um, oh, I think I found it. <laughs> okay, I. You are the different. A it's a different cover slide than what we're seeing right now. So hopefully it's the correct slide deck. Sorry, just hang on. I'll be one second. Just wondering if you tried to yeah pull your. Um, cursor down so we could see the PowerPoint. If that makes sense. Sorry. Okay, so good. Well, that looks a little healthier. All right. Okay, so we'll fast forward a couple slides. Thank you so much for finding that. Thank you for helping me out. I'm, <laughs> I'm so sorry for inconvenience. And this is my first time like I'm presenting over Zoom. So let me know what slide to stop on. Uh, okay, then. I think next we're on one. the data. No, the no. This is findings. Uh, could you just go back a little bit? It's the EHR viewer slide. Yes. Okay. So, uh, so EHR viewer is the is the an uh, online 
web based portal that authorized healthcare provider to look at the information that uh, already included below. I mean, like if paramedics have the access to the EHR viewer, they can look at those information before treating to any patient. So the next one. So uh, in this study, we uh, focused on our ACP level uh, paramedics. There is a three level of paramedics, primarily ACP, PCP, and EMR. So we choose ACP level uh, paramedics because uh, we think that uh, they, are, they, are, they have a sufficient uh, depth and breadth of knowledge for the practitioner to properly interpret and patient information they are accessing. And we established two groups. Uh, one is experimental group, another one is control group. Uh, in our experimental group, they do have uh, access to eHealth uh, database. And in our control group, they didn't have access to our database. And face-to-face -face and telephonic semi-structural interview are considered the most suitable primary data collection. So we conducted our face-to-face uh, -face and telephonic interview to collect our data. In terms of the findings, the next slide, both the control group and the experimental group felt that additional patient information would support improved clinical assessment and treatment. They said both groups also agreed that information was not required on each and every call. Practitioner also raised concern about the risk of relying too heavily on patient data instead of hand on clinical assessment to determine treatment. Next limitation. So uh, our sample size was uh, too small and we only focused on the ACP level. So the research team, they uh, realized that future research may need it at the other paramedics level, which is called like PCP level, EMR level, or CEU level, I mean, community paramedic level. In the next slide, in conclusion, we realized that policy guideline or parameter may need in place to proper use of EHR, I mean e-viewer for the paramedics. And we also found that this project is deemed successful, but further expansion of e-viewer access will require more investment in the technology. At this time, the system doesn't have the infrastructure to support a full implementation of a wider pilot and access to the e-viewer. The next slide. and. Uh, the Saskatchewan College of Paramedics wishes to acknowledge and thank our partners, eHealth Saskatchewan and the Saskatchewan Health Authority. The next one. So thanks again for your attention and I'm pleased to take any question you may have at this stage. And I'm so sorry for the inconvenience about the slides and all other issues. No problem. Uh, thank you again for your presentation. So we're opening up the chat room here. Um, I think access to data is uh, is something that's near and dear to almost everybody, every researcher's heart. We've uh, yes. definitely experienced it in for research, and this is a very interesting case about access for uh, frontline caregivers. Yes, for sure. Thank Any you. questions for uh, Rashad? So while that's still coming in, so um, you had mentioned the small sample size. So what do you think is necessary to move this forward? Um, you know, because, what... um, uh, in our province, uh, ACP level, like we conducted this study with the ACP level, right? But we have a more number of PCP level. This is the second stage of the licensing body. I mean, second stage of the parameters. So I think if we can expand this study in future, then we can see how the PCP level paramedics are doing, how they feel, what is their experience or what is their perception. That is why we think like we can expand this study in future because yeah. most of our paramedics are in PCP level and very few are in ACP level. Yeah. Well, very interesting work and, and, and exactly the types of projects that are needed to, to help us progress and move forward. So thank you again for presenting on behalf of your team. Thanks and again, so I'll just ask you to monitor the chat room for any other questions that come in. Sometimes the delay is a, is a little bit slow there. So thank, thank you, you again. so much for listening. To me, and I'm really sorry again for all kinds of inconvenience. Could happen to anybody. Not a problem. We're just glad you made the time to join us today. Thank you. Okay, thank you.
All right, so uh, moving on to our fifth one. We're a little bit late here today, but uh, I'm enjoying all the very interesting discussion and the presentations. Uh, next is uh, Dr. Mansell, who will be uh, discussing uh, improving outcomes in kidney recipients with a randomized control trial of pre-transplant education. So I will turn the presenting uh, privileges over to Dr. Mansell. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, perfect. I have these new ear pods in and I've got kids and dogs at home. So I figured it would be better to do it this way versus speakers. So anyway, I'm glad it's working. Let me try and share my screen now here. Okay, can everyone see that? Yep, we're up and running, looks great. Okay, perfect. So thank you so much for the opportunity to present to get the day. Um, my name is Holly Mansell, and I'm an associate professor at the University of Saskatchewan with pharmacy. And my practice area is in solid organ transplant. And so today I'm going to present the results of a study that my team has undertaken improve, entitled Improving Outcomes in Kidney Recipients, a Randomized Controlled Trial of a Pre-Transplant Education Intervention. And so this is my team right here, who I'm presenting on behalf of. And I'd like to start off by thanking both Scherf and Skipper because we were just so fortunate to receive a SPROUT grant and without this our research would not have been possible. So our study really stemmed from a need that we were seeing in clinical practice. So kidney transplant is an extremely complex procedure and patients who receive a solid organ transplant have to take immunosuppressant medications for life. And I'm a pharmacist by trade. And one of the things that I've been involved in is the discharge teaching that occurs after a patient receives their transplant and before they go home to the, from the hospital. And so over the years, our healthcare team has really noticed that many patients often seem surprised and sometimes upset that they're gonna to have to take these medications for life. And I've included a couple of quotes from actual patients here, which kind of highlights the problem. So clearly something critical is being missed. And it's not for a lack of education or teaching because our team does provide good information. So we think before the transplant, both written and verbally, but there's a gap between what's being provided as information and what patients are learning. And so we performed a needs assessment, which had four separate components. So we first did an extensive literature review about transplant education, and we completed a descriptive study to learn more about our pre-transplant patients. And this included their health literacy, their beliefs in medicine, their satisfaction and their knowledge. And we completed a qualitative study with healthcare providers as well. And we also conducted a focus group with kidney recipients to learn more about what they wish they would have known in hindsight before their transplant. And this study in particular resulted in sort of a pivotal change in our direction. I think as a pharmacist, I kind of um, had been under the assumption that our intervention would be largely to do with medications, but we learned really so much from this group of patients. And so they told us that um, basically medications were just the tip of the iceberg and there were misconceptions about all kinds of things, including the testing before the surgery and about the surgery. And they wanted to know about the recovery and so on. And so from there, uh, we went on to create a six part video series, which describes the kidney transplant process in its entirety. And video was chosen as the medium because it can be delivered consistently from patient to patient. And we can use illustrations for patients with low health literacy. It doesn't require any more healthcare provider time so we can add it on to what's already existing. And as well, it can be delivered to patients at home and replayed and shared with caregivers and family members and repeated as much as they like, basically. So the series consists of six videos and they each describe a stage of the transplant process and they range between three and 23 minutes in length. And they feature an anime character who's kind of embarking on a transplant journey. And difficult concepts are animated and there's patient and healthcare provider narratives all embedded throughout, which help to provide a layer of support and authenticity. And so the whole process took us about three years and we took input from patients throughout the process and over 35 patients volunteered to help and share their knowledge and experience with transplantation. 
And so from there, we conducted a randomized control trial to test the intervention delivered electronically to patients before their transplant. And so given that many patients live in remote and rural settings, we really felt it was important that we tried to deliver this electronic education or this education electronically, I should say. And so patients were asked if they wanted to participate while they were being worked up or, whether, or listed for a kidney transplant and waiting on the wait list. And we asked patients in Saskatoon, Regina and Calgary to participate when they were visiting in person at an in-person appointment during sort of a routine sort of care-based appointment that they would see us in person. And if they were interested, they were asked to fill out a baseline survey on an iPad. And then from there, they were randomized to receive either the education or the video group, with, which was our intervention, or the control, which was standard education. And they weren't exactly told what the intervention was. They were just told that they would receive additional education. It was an educational study and they wouldn't have to come back for any additional appointments. Everything would be delivered to them electronically. And individuals who were randomized to the intervention group received an email with the password protected videos and instructions on how to watch them at home. And then in approximately one month, all patients were emailed a follow-up survey and the primary outcome was the difference between the groups in their changes in knowledge. And our secondary outcomes were quality of life, um, self-efficacy, beliefs of medicine, and satisfaction with their pre-transplant education. And we also really wanted to learn more about their video viewing habits. So our biggest question was, what percentage will actually even watch the video? So if you go to all this work to creating such a thing, will people even want to watch it? And so this really will help us to learn about whether delivering education in this method is worthwhile. And video viewing statistics were available through the infrastructure that we had kind of set up through the Social Sciences Research Laboratory at the US, who managed the study and all of the data from the sites. And so whenever possible, obviously we strive to use existing and validated tools to measure outcomes, but unfortunately there was no such tool to evaluate kidney transplant knowledge and so we had to develop our own, which we called the Kidney Transplant Understanding Tool. And before our randomized control trial, of course, we tested it in both pre and post transplant cohorts. And we evaluated it for um, content validity, internal consistency, construct validity, and uh, reproducibility and floor and ceiling effects. And the tool consists of multiple choice and true and false questions, and a total of 69 is a perfect score. And so when COVID hit, we made the executive decision to end the study. And at that time we had approached 222. And of those um, who agreed and met the full inclusion criteria to participate, there were 162. And then in total, 132 completed both questionnaires. And so this was the data set that we were able to analyze. And so we had 64 patients in our video group and we had 68 in our control group. And the demographics were similar amongst the groups with baseline knowledge scores of around 55 um, in both groups. And our video viewing statistics in the intervention group indicated that 70% watched the videos and we defined watching the videos as at least 80% of every single video. And an additional 8% had received DVDs because they didn't have access to the technology and we of course didn't want to exclude anyone. And so we had a workaround process for those patients. And um, they reported 8% um, of our, our study reported participation, I should say 8% of our intervention group. And then the mean knowledge change in the intervention was significantly higher than in the control group. And from there, we went on to do a subgroup analysis of those who we actually had objective evidence that they had watched the videos and larger improvements were noted in that group. And then, then with respect to our secondary outcomes, there were no significant differences that were noted on our self-efficacy scores or our beliefs in medicine or our quality of life scores. However, um, patients in the intervention group reported higher satisfaction with their education in general. And um, we had some Likert scale questions, which we had, had um, looked at for this quantitatively. And we also had qualitative feedback that patients were able to provide. And so we had several positive comments about the videos as well. And I've just kind of included some of them here for you. 
And so our conclusion is that video education delivered electronically to kidney transplant patients in the pre-transplant setting improved knowledge and satisfaction and high uptake of the patient-oriented video series and positive feedback suggests that this type of intervention is of utility and maybe even more so for patients in remote settings. And further studies should address the applicability in other chronic disease states and healthcare settings. So thank you so much. I have to show you my acknowledgement slides because there's just so many people who contributed to this project. And as many projects go, you know, you start with one idea and it just expands and snowballs. And so there's several other kind of spin-off projects that we're working off on right now. And so thank you so much for listening and thank you so much for everybody who's helped us out along the way. Thank Oops. you so much. Oh, thank you, Holly. Uh, questions? We did have a question coming in while everybody's still typing in here. Uh, we had a question from, trying to see who it was from. I think it may have been Sarah asking, um, Sarah, was that you asking about the video production? Yes. Yeah, okay. I was. Thank you, Holly. Great presentation um, and uh, neat journey. I like seeing it <laughs> three years later. Um, who did your guys' animation work and uh, video? Oh, that was an interesting process. We could have coffee with that one. It's really hard to find an animator. And we ended up actually um, trying out a few different ideas, um, but it only works if you hire somebody. <laughs> and so we ended up finding um, a person that I worked with in Colorado, actually. And she does medical animations and she's been wonderful to work with. So if you ever need, I can always talk to you offline. But, awesome. And we, ha we do have a local producer too, as well. That we've been working with. Great, thanks. Well, that was, that was uh, uh, thank you, Holly. That was a wonderful presentation. Again, um, uh, I'm going to actually just refer you to the chat. I'm going to do one more. Uh, Mamada, would you like to ask your question? And then I will just, there's so, I, I just hate to refer people to the chat room when we can actually have a little bit of interaction here. So uh, Mamada, we have uh, another question from you and then we will just revert to chat room. Uh, hello, Dr. Manson. I'm a research scientist at the uh, SHA, and I am really interested in the educational video which you're using animation, and I think it is going to be very appropriate for other health topics as well, um, and especially the reason why I say um, there could be other kind of barriers like language barriers or, um, you know, inability to like really read dense material or not really wanting to do that, but or working with children even. Uh, so I was just wondering, do you have any other uh, videos on any other health topics? I would be really interested to access those or talk to you about that if you do have any. Yeah, for sure. Um, so based off of our work with the kidney series, the love sorry, the Lung Association um, kind of found out about our project and they said, hey, wait a minute, can you do something similar for lung recipients? And so we've worked with the Lung Association over the past um, almost two years now. And we've recently created a series for lung transplant recipients. And so we're working to get that evaluation up and going as well. Um, but yeah, it's, it's been quite a journey. I, I've worked, now that I've worked with these animators and with um, the video producer too, I've, I've done some work with um, cannabis education for children in some of the schools around here, um, collabor collaborating with Chris, but it, it is just, there's such a need for, you know, information that people can understand. Great. So maybe just we'll squeeze in one more question from Heather. Hi. Just wondering about the possibility or probability of translating into the major indigenous languages because of the high numbers of kidney patients within our indigenous population? That's an excellent question and something I would absolutely love to do. Um, it's something that's on our radar. It hasn't been able to be put into play um, for our study, unfortunately, but once our studies wrap up, um, we'd also like to work on translating them into French as well and look at all the options of different needs of our populations and how we could translate them for sure. 
Great questions. And, and thank you again, uh, Dr. Mansell. Uh, excellent work. And uh, there'll be some more questions and comments uh, waiting for you in the chat room. Thank you again for being part of a health research showcase. Thank you. Oh, I think I've lost my sharing privileges. Uh, mm -hmm. All right, so uh, on to the, the, the last presentation of the day. And um, we did a, a fairly good job at staying almost on track. We're only a few minutes behind here. But our last presentation, I'd like to invite uh, Crystal Giesbrick, who will be presenting on behalf of her team. So um, I will turn the screen over to her and we look forward to hearing about uh, this exciting project. Hello, everyone. My name is Crystal Giesbrecht. I will start and then my co-author Miranda Field will continue. And we also worked on this project with Dr. Carrie Lavalley and Dr. Nick Carlton, as well as many other collaborators who, who we will name on an upcoming slide. Natawehuen means the art of self-healing in the Cree language. It's a 13-week culturally relevant, holistic, and trauma and violence informed group for Indigenous women who've experienced intimate partner violence. Women get together one evening per week for cultural and creative activities aimed at improving health by building resilience and strengthening social connections and connection to culture. The Public Health Agency of Canada put out a call for the development of interventions for people impacted by family violence. PALS chose to apply for this funding with the support of our partners to design an intervention specifically for Indigenous women who've experienced intimate partner violence. Because Indigenous women comprise approximately 16% of women in our province, but 80% of women who seek services at domestic violence shelters are Indigenous. Natawehuen began in 2016. There was a pilot and then the group ran concurrently three times in three communities, Prince Albert, Regina and Moose Jaw. Natawehuen was an incredible team effort and would not have been possible without many people involved. The project included the program design, where Barbara Fraser, who's a knowledge keeper, worked together with Norma Rabbitskin and Willie Ermine, also knowledge keepers, who shared teachings that provided the basis for Natalie One. The program was then developed and implemented concurrently in the three communities, and then we completed the research. The goal of all of this was to be able to have a program manual that could be shared widely with other communities and also to provide research results to confirm if this is indeed helpful for Indigenous women who've experienced violence. At every group session, there are three team members present. The first one is the facilitator. In two of the groups, the facilitator was a knowledge keeper who also had the ability to teach Indigenous traditional arts. And in one of the groups, it was facilitated by a trauma and violence informed artist. Domestic violence advocates met, managed logistical pieces for the group. So they conducted client intakes, they communi communicated with clients between groups, they arranged transportation, and they also provided information related to safety planning and ongoing support. We feel that this role is very important when working with survivors to reduce barriers to participation and also to check in and provide support related to safety. The women who participated in the group had experienced intimate partner violence, and while many were safely out of those relationships, several were still in a relationship with a partner who they were afraid of at the time that the group was happening. The third key role is the elder who's present at all group sessions, starts the session with prayer, and offers cultural teachings and is available 
to offer support and guidance to the women. We also had childcare on site, transportation to the group was provided for all women and their children, and a meal was served for everyone at the beginning of each group. The implementing that to wake one, everyone involved in the project had one day training session on trauma and violence informed practice. A recommendation for future trauma and violence informed research is to develop a training protocol that ensures ongoing support and training for all team members, researchers, and also the, the facilitation team. Throughout our work on this project, we were connected with other projects funded by the Public Health Agency of Canada across the country, and we worked together on a document titled Toward a Trauma and Violence Informed Research Ethics Module. And the link is there, and we hope that this may be of use to others who are interested in doing similar trauma and violence informed intervention research. This was a mixed method study where we collected responses to a number of quantitative measures at intake. Women completed those again at the end of the group and one year after the, after the group had finished. We had women fill out questionnaires related to experience of, of abuse and also traumatic symptoms. The quantitative measures were repeated at three time points and the ones, or sorry, the measures that were repeated at the three time points included two measures of challenges, that's depression and anxiety, and six measures of strengths, personal and interpersonal agency, resilience, post-traumatic growth, connectedness, and quality of life. For our quantitative analysis, we use multi-level modeling to look at the changes in women's self-assessments on the different measures at the three time points we saw significant increases in participants' self-reported sense of personal agency, resilience, connectedness, and post-traumatic growth, as well as significant decreases in participants' self-reported depression and anxiety from when the women began Natawehuin until when we completed the follow-up research. The qualitative measures consisted of focus groups at the end of each session end at the one year follow up. The qualitative results were really looking at the four areas of well being emotional, intellectual, spiritual and physical. And a lot of the information that we were finding from the qualitative pieces is that it was consistent with the quantitative measures. Many of the women reported um, self care and self awareness increases. They also spoke to not using or engaging in drug use or alcohol use. And many of the women spoke to having a sense of purpose uh, for their life. One of the participants shared that it was essential for them to learn the cultural, to learn their culture and to practice it. Not only did it make them feel better, but it allowed the women the time and the space to support each other and to focus on taking care of their children and their families. The Natawehoan outcomes really started to form in four different areas, in identity, creativity, community, and resiliency. With identity, we had statistically significant increases in personal agency and post-traumatic growth, and these were noted from the beginning to the end of the group. With creativity, at the one-year follow-up, Many women stated that they had translated their expressive arts that they used in the program into their own lives, using it to stay out of their destructive habits and integrate into their own healing practices. Many of the women noted sharing these practices with their family members and also having the opportunity to speak to their care providers about the um, strategies and the different interventions they have put into place in their lives. For the community, many women noted that their that there was an increase in their cultural connectedness and this was noted from the beginning to the end of the group. In terms of resiliency, a statistically significant increase in resiliency and quality of life were noted from the beginning to the end of the group. A participant shared that their overall well-being did increase. They were able to take care of themselves, take care of their family, they were able to feel empowered and feel inspired by the activities and by the relationships that they had formed. 
they started to feel proud and taking on the opportunity to pass along these knowledges to their children and to their other family members. Ending with a quote from our participant here, Nataweihoan is really proof that our culture is something that brings us all together and makes us embrace each other's strengths and weaknesses or helps us through our weaknesses and just embrace each other. The pictures you see in front of you are some of the art pieces that were created in the groups. They had the opportunity to do both collaborative and individual art pieces. The collaborative pieces here are of the women in the circle and they were able to um, represent themselves through these images. The women also had many opportunities to partake in beading and these were some of the examples that they had done in this group. We want to thank you for your time and seeing a, a few minutes over to hear us and we just want to direct you to um, the PATHS website. The, um, the manual is in production right now and it is anticipated that it will be available soon. Data collection has completed and the findings um, are being compiled. It is anticipated that we will have community reports and journal articles coming out in the near future. Thank you again. Great. Thank you so much. Um, I think I'm, I'm, I'm echoing other comments that artwork is, is uh, absolutely beautiful. And I'm, I'm going to ask as well before we finish the, and before some other questions come in, if you could actually share that website, if you haven't already, in the chat room uh, so people can have that in, in easy access and share it there. Um, thank you for being patient and waiting till the end here. That was a great presentation and seeing lots there. Can I open up if, if we have a Turn your camera on. Oh, there we go. Okay, sorry about that. I thought it would be okay. Um, any questions for our presenters here? Um, comments, anything coming in here before we have to log off? Lots of really positive. Ah, I'll invite Sandy, uh, Sandy to ask her question. Good afternoon. Thank you so much for this presentation. This is incredible. I, I was really impressed. I, I I really don't know how to describe how happy to see this. And and there's a lot of work that is being done in the province uh, with the Indigenous women because through sharing stories we can build on and also learn from their experiences. I was just wanting to know what your next steps, if there are other projects you think they can involve the Indigenous women to steer and guide the project, especially with, in the area of addiction and mental health as we're going through this right now. Thank you so much. Yes, thanks so much for the question. So with this funding that we had from the Public Health Agency of Canada, we had from October 2016 to, to this fall, just finishing up to complete this intervention research that we spoke about, designing the project and collect the data. And now we're just writing it up, but we do hope that this will continue. So within this grant, our plan was to make a manual that could be shared widely and hopefully to see the program start up in other communities beyond the three. So while it's not currently running, we, or while our, I should say, while it's not running within this grant, it has continued. The women that were part of Natawehu and in Moose Jaw continued to do it in a slightly different but ongoing way. Those women participants took leadership. They continued to do some really just absolutely amazing beadwork that has been displayed in the Moose Jaw Art Gallery. There's, there's been two shows there and they've continued to get together for peer support and to do that ongoing work. So depending on cultural teachings and, and connections, and different factors in, in communities, Natawehuan is adaptable and can look a little bit different. So while we aren't running it currently, we really hope to support others who might want to do it, to share the information and, and to look for other opportunities to keep this going. Thank you. This is a great network. So it's 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 hate to see it go. Thank you so much again. Thank you. Good. Uh, I don't see any other questions, just a flood of compliments and uh, some kudos to your, to your team there. So uh, thank you again for being part of Research Showcase 2020. Uh, it was a great way to end the day. Uh, very, very uh, 
impactful research that's going on there. So please do not leave the meeting before you go get a chance to go into the chat room and, and, and read all of the uh, positive comments that have come in. Uh, for everybody else, thank you for being a part of it today. We begin day two tomorrow at 9 a.m. and we will be looking at community-based and participatory action research at 9 a.m. tomorrow with again, some more Saskatchewan snapshots. So thank you everyone, enjoy your evening and uh, we will see you at 9 a.m. tomorrow.